Um, my, my family calls me Buzz. I went, uh, when I was eight years old, and got a haircut from a guy who was in the military. And I swear, I told this guy, cut it long, because everybody knew his tendency. So I said, cut it really, really long. And I came home with just enough hair that it might actually like lay down. And that's what he considered really long. And my brother called me Buzz. And ever since eight years old, happy birthday, Buzz. Merry Christmas, Buzz. Family talks about me as Pastor Buzz regularly. So, um, so Buzz is just this nickname that I'm known by. And so I knew something was serious when my brother said, uh, here's my little brother, Chris. Okay. Um, it's weird. Nicknames stick sometimes, and they stick for the weirdest reasons, and I don't know why they do. Um, why they do. Thankfully, I'm glad I like Buzz. A lot of people get stuck with nicknames that they don't, and frankly, I needed to laugh this week. Um, and so I wanted to share with you three of my favorite unfortunate nicknames from the sports world. I love sports, so I'm going to share with you. Um, all right, number one, we're going to put his picture up here. The Flying Tomato, Sean White. Yes, this... Uh, He's a, a kid who was a really, really good snowboarder, and he was maybe 20-something years old. He was in the Olympics, the very first U.S. snowboarding gold medal. Um, and, and his name was Sean White. He had this big, flowing red hair, and it flew behind him. Um, unfortunately, now he's all grown up. That's the second picture there. And people still call him the Flying Tomato. And apparently, he <laughs> has decided that it has gotten old. And no longer likes the name. So, that's number one. Uh, speaking of growing out of names, number two, Sid the Kid Crosby. All right. For those of you who don't actually like sports and don't like hockey, Sidney Crosby is this 19-year-old when he came into the league, and he is the very first 19-year-old to be named a captain. He's the very first um, teenager to ever win the scoring title for the NHL. He's a phenomenal hockey player. He's like the Wayne Gretzky of our era. Um, and his nickname was Sid the Kid, and whenever somebody came up with that nickname, they obviously didn't think about what that would be like in 12 years. <laughs> and so there's Sid the Kid on the right and giving you the glare that you, he would probably give you if you called him Sid the Kid. So, last but not least, my absolute favorite NFL <laughs> running back, Doug Martin. He is five foot nine. he is about 220, he is a, a thick, solid dude. Um, but nothing puts fear into an opponent besides telling them that they're going to be playing against the muscle hamster. <laughs> and I was looking at that picture thinking, if I had that guy behind me and chasing me, I'd probably run pretty fast too. Yeah. So, um, today we're going to look at an encounter with uh, Jesus. We've been doing this series on John, and now we're kind of past Easter. We're going to look at an encounter with um, a guy who got stuck with a really bad nickname in the Bible. And that is Doubting Thomas. So if you have a Bible, um, feel free to open it up to John 20. If you don't, no worries. I will read the passage for you. One of these days, I'm going to talk John into letting me use a lapel mic. I'm so bad at doing anything with this hand that's holding this. All right, here we go. I'll use it today. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, this is John 20, 24 through 31. Now Thomas, called Didymus, which means the twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe him. And a week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he turned to Thomas and said, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet have believed. And Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing that you might have life in his name. Um, okay. God, um, meet us in this uh, encounter. May we find ourselves in Thomas' Jesus and you um, with us in the midst of it. 
just guide us and uh, use this time to your glory. We love you. Amen. Um, a little background on Thomas. I'm going to give you kind of the overall of what we know of him. Uh, he doesn't pop up too much, but he is definitely in John's gospel. And in John chapter 11, um, which is actually uh, the passage that I was reading to my grandpa as he um, passed away, uh, Jesus is going uh, to bring Lazarus back from the grave. And um, in order to do that, Jesus has to go dangerously close to a group of people who want to kill him. And all the other disciples are going, no, just let him sleep. Maybe he'll get better. We really shouldn't go over there. That's kind of dangerous. And uh, and uh, Thomas speaks up and says, no, let us go with him that we may die too. Um, he could have been known forever as brave Thomas. <laughs> Loyal Thomas, maybe. But no, doubting Thomas is what we get. And then uh, John 14, Jesus uh at the Last Supper, he's explaining to his disciples that he's going to be leaving them the next day, but that he's going to a place, and he's going to prepare a place for them. And it's going to be fantastic, and they're going to go where he goes. And um, everyone's thinking, what on earth is he talking about? He's saying he has to die, and yet he's going to this place, and we're going to go with him, and it's going to be phenomenal, and he's preparing a place for us. And nobody would say anything, but Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Can you show us the way? Um, so we could have ended up with honest Thomas or Thomas with good questions but <laughs> doubting Thomas is what we get and uh, last but not least there's a very strong tradition that Thomas was the disciple who brought um, faith, brought the story of Jesus Christ, the good news about him to India and to that region and all of the disciples um, laid down their life for their faith they were all martyrs for their faith in the end and so Thomas was this man who um, Besides saying, my Lord and my God, in the passage we just read, he was a man of dedication and conviction who, who lived his life to bring the gospel to people. So we could have ended up with dedicated Thomas, but we get doubting Thomas. And frankly, I think it's a bad rap. Um, what, what do we call him doubting Thomas for? Because all of his friends told him, after he'd watched the Lord die on a cross, we've seen him, we've seen him, and he goes, yeah, not buying it. Um, and frankly, I kind of agree with him in that if I was in his shoes, um, it's good to be skeptical. It's okay to doubt uh, and, and to wonder if, if it's really true. I mean, they were suggesting something to him that was absolutely unbelievable. That Jesus would take up his life again and would invite them into eternal life. Um, he doesn't want to fall for a lie. Um, he doesn't, he's not somebody who's gullible. He's not somebody who will trust something that's uh, been fabricated. And um, I remember that that doubt is really helpful. I was a young man on a Boy Scout trip, and I was in charge of strapping down all the luggage on top of a car. Mm -hmm. But I was really glad there was somebody who seriously doubted whether or not I was capable of doing this. Because my dad came along afterwards and realized I had done just slipknots that the second we started driving, <laughs> <laughs> luggage everywhere. Um, and I wish that somebody had doubted my own dad's not tying when he had tied the refrigerator to the back of the truck while we were driving the freeway or the, the um, mattress later. Both of those <laughs> flew off too, but there was nobody there to doubt uh, his not tying skills. So um, doubt and skepticism, especially in terms of God, um, can be a really, really good thing. But I think often in Christian circles, um, seen as a bad thing. I've been a part of circles that go, well, if you just believe, then, then God could really work, as if somehow our level of belief was able to tie God's hands or not. Um, this story of Thomas um, invites us to actually come to God, to bring him questions and to see how he might meet us, and, and when he does meet us, to live out our convictions. Um, the passage starts with Thomas not being with his friends on um, <coughs> Easter Sunday when they saw the Lord. A week had passed before Thomas got to meet him. And um, his friends are saying, and it's a, in, a, in the Greek it says that they were repeatedly telling him, no, we saw him, it, this is real. And then another one would go, here's the deal, we gave him fish and he ate it. He was legitimately there. And then another one would say something. And, um, and I was reading this going, man, try not to miss gathering together. God can show up. And you might miss something, but... 
Uh, but Thomas wasn't there, and I can get why. It's funny, uh, in moments of sadness and grief and this Jesus who he was following and expecting to see become the king of Israel and it was going to be triumphant and marvelous and, and then it went sideways. And Thomas was heartbroken. And it's in these spaces of our lives where things seem to go sideways and not according to plan and where God doesn't show up in the way that we expect him to. Um, that's, that's the places of doubt for me. That's where doubt has come up in my life. Um, and so Thomas wasn't there. And my guess is he was off somewhere alone, uh, just trying to figure out what to do next. Sadness and grief. In my own experience, I uh, went to Arizona for a year. I might have shared this with you before. But I went down there with these great plans. I was going to be a, a college pastor down in Arizona, and there was this fantastic internship, and the guy offering the internship was the, uh, the father of my girlfriend of a couple of years, so I figured this is a shoe in like, Here I am coming out of Bible school, and uh, I love working with college students. I have some experience, and, and now I'm going down there, and this girl that I've been dating for, for a couple of years, this might be the one, and now I can finally stop this from being a long-distance relationship and go down there and cement the relationship. So I'll start this college ministry thing, and uh, I'll get married, and I'm going to have this amazing, beautiful life. And then I got down there, and uh, the internship didn't happen. Uh, it was given to a guy who um, the pastor believed that he had uh, a lot more potential that he could work with in him. And uh, the girl and I broke up uh, after I got down there. Apparently, long distance was how we did relationships. <laughs> and, um, and I found myself working with computers, doing tech support for UPS um, in a foreign place, apart from uh, where my family lived for the first time in my life. And I was in the desert, and I didn't really have this ministry outlet that I was planning on. And I thought... Wow, either God bailed on me and he doesn't really exist, or if he does exist, he's playing a very, very sick, cruel joke and has a bad sense of humor. And um, things had just gone so unaccording to my plan that I was ready to say, I can't believe it. There's no way I can believe this. Um, that was my most dramatic experience of doubt um, since I've, I've come to Christ in just 20 some odd years now. Um, but doubt can come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Okay? It can come in, in little spots. It can come in intellectual doubts. So I remember while I was in Bible school, I remember looking at all the different discrepancies among all the manuscripts that were used to bring together the Bible and seeing all these little differences and going, how can we even trust this one? And then um, I did a different study on did any of those discrepancies actually change what the text said or meant and found out that it did very little. And through my studies, I actually came to truly believe that the Bible is, is an incredibly uh, reliable document. Emotional doubt. Why is it making being a Christian making me happier? I, I've been sold this idea that somehow if I come to Christ, then my life will get better. And now it's going uh, not according to plan, and, and it's getting harder because of my faith. You know, spiritual doubt. I talked to so many people and felt it myself when when you're praying in a really desperate, dark time, and you feel like your prayers just hit the roof and they bounce back down, you go, man, where's God in this? Doubt is never fun or happy. Um, but I believe it's good, and I believe God has a purpose in it. And it can push us from where we are now to somewhere new. Um, and that's kind of at the heart of it. It's, it's a healthy thing, um, especially depending on how we respond to it. Um, I know for me, when I encounter doubts, uh, I, I'm a pastor. I'm not supposed to have doubts, right? And so um, when I encounter doubt, one of the, the tests for me is, is I want to go um, isolate myself and not share those with anybody. Um, and I want to disengage from them and I want to avoid them and maybe focus on something else that, that is more comfortable. And in the process, I end up like Tom, kind of wandering around alone and not with uh, the rest of the people of faith around me. Um, but if we will engage um, our doubts with God and with others, I believe God can use them to, to grow us. Um, 
that logo you guys just talked about, the boat cruising through some crazy waves. Um, and that that is a picture of going somewhere. That's a picture of an adventure. And, and this church is the church of the adventurous spirit. And um, I think doubt is one of those times where we get tested. Do we have the enough adventurous spirit to charge through some things in order to see what lies beyond and see what God wants to give us? Um, the Christian faith is not built on blind faith. Jesus never encourages or asks for us to have blind faith. Um, in fact, quite the opposite is necessary if we're ever going to grow. Blind faith means that we just sort of get blown around by the current. And, and if you've ever gone whitewater rafting, anybody ever done that? It's a good time, right? But if you just sat in the boat and everybody had their oars and they just kind of held them up in the air as victory torches while you go down this river, it can get nasty. Um, there's some resistance that happens when you're like trying to dodge the rocks so that you can go through the little spot where the, the rapids take you. And um, there's resistance in it. But in the process of doing that, you get stronger and you have an adventure. And that's kind of how doubt is and when it comes to um, what we believe. We face resistance, but if we will push through it, um, we'll end up in a stronger place. Jesus doesn't challenge Thomas not to have questions or to have doubts. In fact, um, he offers to meet Thomas's doubts directly. Um, but he does challenge him one thing, belief. And I think there's a significant difference, especially when you read the Bible, when you come across this term of believing. And, and believing in the Bible is not about uh, intellectual assent to something and going, well, I guess two plus two is four, so I, I agree with that. Um, believing in the Bible is saying, I've decided that this is true, I'm going to put my weight down on it, now I'm going to live it out. Um, and the opposite of faith is unbelief. And unbelief um, is very different from doubt. Doubt says, I can't believe this unless I see that this is true and that I can put my weight down on this and that and I have some questions that need to get answered. Unbelief says, I don't care what you show me. There's no way I'm moving from this place. Um, and when you are in a place of unbelief, you will refuse to be moved. You are stuck. And God does not want us to be stuck. And maybe Thomas was so discouraged by what he had seen that he threw this thing out to the other disciples who were trying to convince him. And he said, all right, I, I'm going to throw out an impossible test. Unless I can put my finger in the hole in Jesus' hands, unless I can verify that, that spear, that verified that he was dead, if I can't put my hand in that wound, I'm not going to believe this to be true. Um, I highly doubt that Thomas ever thought that that would be possible. Um, but then Jesus shows up, and it's interesting because it's a week later. Jesus wasn't there when Thomas said that. And Jesus says, hey, Thomas, why don't you come over here? Put your finger in the hole in my hand. Put your hand in the side. It's time to move past your doubts and into belief. And there's some things that are really comforting about that for me. And one is that God knows our doubts. He knows our questions. Jesus addresses Thomas just as if Thomas had just said it to him, and yet he wasn't there. It's very similar to another passage in John 1, 44 through 48. Um, Nathaniel is told about Jesus, and he goes, you know, there's, there's nothing good that can come out of Nazareth. Why would I believe in any guy coming out of Nazareth? Um, and then he goes and meets Jesus, and Jesus says, oh, here's an Israelite in whom there is no deceit whatsoever. And Nathaniel says, well, Jesus, how do you know me? I haven't met you before. This is our first interaction. And he goes, oh, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree. Before Philip called you. And Nathaniel says, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. He goes from, I doubt this can be true to, I am fully convinced that you're the one. And that's exactly what Thomas does. And it's a beautiful thing that the Lord does for Thomas in telling him the exact words that he had said because it reminds him that he's always been the way. And it's crazy when we doubt and when we are struggling with doubt, 
um, we often think that God is not there. And what this passage tells me is that our doubts don't change God at all. It doesn't change his love for us. It doesn't change his presence with us. And whether or not we believe that God is either with us or for us, it doesn't change his stance towards us. And that is a beautiful, beautiful gift. Our lack of faith does not change God's faithfulness. Two, second thing. Um, it's in the midst of our questions and our skepticism, if we'll bring them to God, that God can make an impression on us. It's a pretty incredible transition to go from there's no way I'm going to believe this to if this happens, you're my Lord and my God. You're in charge of my life and you are God. That is a huge declaration of who Jesus is. And it's interesting, he didn't actually get the answer he asked for. He never put his finger in the hole in his hands. He never put his hand in the side. At least that's how I read it. Jesus says, you can feel free to do this. And Thomas falls down on his knees and declares, this is God. Uh, oftentimes, the answer that we ask for, God doesn't give us. It's not quite that easy. Um, but if we will look, and if we will look sincerely, and if we'll be open to what we will see, I believe that God can show up in a really beautiful, powerful way. Um, it brings to mind the book, Case for Christ. Lee Strobel wrote it. Um, he was a journalist who was just going to do a sincere study of the Gospels to prove that Christianity was a farce. Um, and in the process, he got answers that he didn't expect, but it wasn't answers that met his unbelief. It was answers that he had doubts about. And so, um, in the process, he catalogued what it was like for him to, to come to evidence of Christ and to believe that Christianity is true. I was telling you about my time in Arizona, a time when I didn't have a ministry outlet, um, when I had broken up with my girlfriend and when life was not going well. And that was, um, those two things were kind of where I based my relationship with God. God loves me because my life is going well. And um, God must like me because, well, I do a lot of stuff for him. Um, that, was the, that was the place I was at. And without either of those things, I discovered that God loves me um, even when my life is not going well and he is with me. And I discovered that God uh, is not waiting for me to do a bunch of stuff for him, for him to like me. And so I walked away from Arizona with a deep down uh, belief that God loves me no matter what. Whether I go sit on a beach and count rocks or whether I'm up here preaching, God loves me just the same. It's a significant step in my faith. Um, another time when I when I had doubts, um, I was working, uh, when I first became a Christian, I was working um, at McDonald's and uh, I was flipping burgers. And, uh, and I had very little money, just enough to make rent. And I discovered as I was reading the Bible this thing about giving at church and um, specifically about they call it a tithe it was and so I, I decided to risk this thing and I, I was skeptical I was doubtful I was going okay how, I don't see how this is going to make sense but I'm gonna, I'll give it a shot so um, so I was giving to the church and then one particular month unexpected bill shows up and I ended up uh, short for rent and I had to make a decision oh, man, do I give or not give and I, I decided to give, um, see what God can do. It was sort of a, a little test. And um, and then I was talking to the pastor, and I'm going, you know, I'm reading the Bible a lot. I'm trying to pray a lot, but I just don't know how to grow next. And he goes, well, why don't you go over to this um, woman in our church's house and mow her lawn? You probably need some way to serve somebody. And so... Um, I did that. I went over and I mowed her lawn. I had a great time doing that. And um, and as I was leaving, she goes, man, I need to pay you. And I said, no, you don't. Treasures in heaven, I'll take those instead. And um, she goes, no, I need to pay you. And I go, all right, just pay me whatever you think is fair. And she wrote me a check for the exact amount that I needed for my rent. And it was in that moment that I said, okay, I guess I can trust God <laughs> with my finances. So this will all work out. And um, 
I became a pivotal moment in my faith where I could go, okay, I'm just going to trust God with my life. It's, it's not super complicated for me. Um, but it took going through these moments of doubt to get there. Um, my grandfather's passing, um, I was with my brother, he's a nurse, he um, doesn't believe me. Uh, and he thinks that when you die, you're just over, like extinguished. Um, and he's asking me, really honestly, like, well, what do you believe happens after somebody dies? And, um, and I started telling him, and it was so weird to have this conversation um, with my brother, for one, and with somebody who doesn't have a faith background at all. Because I'm realizing that the stuff that I kind of take for granted, and if I were to talk with one of you all about it, they'd already about it. He's like, oh yeah, we're going to be in heaven. It's going to be great. I'm telling my brother this. I'm like, well, here's what I think happens. And uh, we die, and then there's Judgment Day, and then uh, by the grace of God, we're invited to be with God forever and eternity and, and to live in a world that's perfect. And, um, and he's looking at me like, what on earth? And I realized this sounds absolutely crazy to him. <laughs> like, he must be sitting there going, man, he's making stuff up right now. <laughs> like, I don't know what he's talking about. And then um, I realized in that moment, I said, you know, I know this sounds really weird, but I've seen enough of, of God in people's lives, and, I, and I've seen enough that God can be trusted in terms of, of who this Jesus is that I guess I trust him with this other stuff that, I, that nobody knows. Nobody knows what happens after we die, but Jesus says this, and he seems to tell the truth most all the time, and so I believe it. Um, it's a level of trust that happens as we move through doubt. In a few weeks, the wonderful McCrary's who um, have, are here at the church often, and uh, they gave me a Christmas present. They're going to invite me to jump out of an airplane with them. <laughs> Christina's not excited. I figure even if it goes wrong, I'm walking to those pearly gates with friends. <laughs> so, 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 guys. <laughs> so be all good. Um, no, but they're inviting me to do this, and, and I, I kind of, I, I thought about it, and I've gone, well, they do this all the time, and, and I'm attached to somebody. I don't even have to remember to pull the cord in case I just black out and forget. Somebody else doing that for me. So, um, so it kind of in theory, I trust the whole idea of a parachute. That's where I'm at. Um, but I guarantee you, after that jump happens, I will have a different trust in parachutes. It'll be a trust that's based on having experienced something and knowing that with my full weight pulling down on it, it still holds me up in the air. Um, Thomas was in a place of unbelief, but when he saw Jesus, um, he was so convinced that that was his experience. His, his doubt had turned to faith in that moment because he experienced something powerful. And I think much the same is true with us. If we will risk, if we will step out and give God a chance to move in our lives, then it becomes deeply personal, and it's no longer the faith that a bunch of Christians believe or that my parents handed down to me. And the deeper we go into it, the more we risk, the more we trust, the more we take the adventurous spirit to play, the more we see God work, and then the more we know we can put our weight down. The passage ends... Um, but these things are written that you might believe in Christ by doing so that you might have life. I think we have two options as we go through life. We can stay where we're at. Um, and I feel like that's kind of like uh, being a walker. You ever watch Walking Dead? Right. The Walking Dead, you know, this show? It's about zombies. And then there's these walkers that go, uh, and they kind of like, they wander through life and they're hungry. And they're pretty much going from meal to meal, trying to just get through. And they're not really alive, and they're not really dead. They're just kind of somewhere in between. And I know that when I am not exercising my faith, I feel like a walker. I'm going through the motions, right where I'm at. Um, it can even be a really good place, but I'm not broke. But then doubts, opportunities, adventures pop up. And if we risk, if we step out with others, with God, something comes alive in us. And that's what John was trying to say through this whole gospel. By believing in Jesus, by living out that faith, it can come alive.
The disciples on Good Friday and Saturday were terrified. They were sitting in a room worrying about their life. Something happened when they encountered Christ. And it was strong enough that they laid all laid down their life. Um, they lived out convictions that they would rather die than turn from. They were fully alive, and that's what we're invited to. And that's what I know happens over the last 20 years in my faith life, every time I risk walking with God. So, lingering questions. Um, do you have doubts and questions that you're facing right now? About faith, about life, about God? If so, I want to invite you to share it with someone. Someone that you know and trust this week. Um, even if that's just God, share it. Share those questions. Um, and then what's the next step? What's the next risk? What's the next adventure that God might be calling you to? Um, consider that. And my prayer for you all and for me as well is that as I encounter doubts, um, that they become opportunities for us to step out and to discover new strength in God, to discover new opportunities and to have adventures. Um, I don't plan on giving up being skeptical about things, but I want to know the truth. I'm going to keep pursuing um, the truth that's in Christ. So, with that, um, let's pray. God, um, thank you for Thomas, uh, for his example. Um, may we not be afraid of doubt, but may we move through it. Um, thank you for your presence and your love in our lives. Um, that it is so strong that it is actually bigger than our questions. And that though we might have doubts, you are still there. Thanks for loving us enough to show up in our lives and to keep presenting yourself real. Keep doing it in new ways, God, so that we can grow with you.